Amen. Amen. Whatever David had, he knew, and he danced till his clothes came down. Amen. Excited about it. We got the victory, church. Now, we have come back to our series. We were out two weeks on vacation, and then they did some cutting around in my mouth, but I told you I'm still not happy about that. But I'm healed. Amen. I can eat like I want to now. That's probably not a good thing. Amen. That bag of circus peanuts, Sister Penny, is gone. <laughs> Amen. And I'm getting ready to work on the second one. Amen. Marks of a Mighty Church, sermon number three. We are in 1 Thessalonians. Mighty Church. The church is going to be mighty. They have to sound it out. They have to understand that the gospel is something that must be broadcast. But another mark of a mighty church is it is committed to the standard of God. Amen? It is committed to the standard of God. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. Let's read this morning, and if you uh, feel led to stand for the reading of the Word of God, you need to do that. If you have to say amen. 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 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, and that it was not in vain. But even after that, we have suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor in God. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God. Amen. Understand God wants you to please him and not please men. Which trieth our hearts. It is God that tries our hearts, church. For neither at any time use we flattery words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. I love how Paul words that. We weren't trying to cheat anybody. And the Lord is our witness. Amen. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children. So being affectionately desireth of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be ch uh, chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Amen. And it says, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, Amen. who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. You may be seated in his presence. What is a standard that we are committed to, the church, is to be committed to the standard of God. The church is to be committed to the standard of God. God. My wife and I, when we were young in our relationship, our dating, came over one day and I had prepared a meal. I cooked it. And I did some cooking on it. Amen. Some of y'all might say I put my foot in it. That's how we say it in the country, amen? And I thought it was good, and 
and she thought it was real good. He can cook. That was the standard that I set forth. Amen? When we were dating. But since then, I have not lived up <laughs> to that standard. Y'all get what I'm trying to tell you this morning? In schools, they have standards. When we were there, they began to outline, they used to call them PPOs. Amen. Pupil performance objectives. And then SO, student objectives and standards and, and content standards. That's basically something a student is to know and how they're tested, they should be able to pass and understand that standard. There's a standard by which you gauge what a good sports team looks like, what a good baseball team looks like, what well-cooked food tastes like. I know I can see y'all sitting now. You go to a, a restaurant and you been used to that standard of how they cook and how they fix and prepare food, and then all of a sudden you go there and it's like, what did they serve us? Your face all tore out of room. That's not good. I don't know about you, but my mother used to tell me, I don't care if you go to somebody's house and you don't like the taste, don't you turn your face up. <laughs> Anybody's mama tell them that? Amen. Don't you dare look like you're done. And don't you, she really struck me. Now, young people, you can learn something from this. Don't get a big heap of it. If you don't know what it is, you're not sure what the standard is, don't pile your plate up full of it. Because my mom made me eat it all. Because that's how her mom did her. Standard. Standards. Standards for a good movie. We all know what a good movie. You leave out of the movie house, you're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. That was awesome. And then sometimes you can't wait to get out. Some folks will get up and walk out for the movies over. Because their standard of what they want has been either met or fallen short of. Committed to the standard of God. How many of you understand? If we as humans have standards, so does God. Integrity is the standard for the Christian and the church of the living God. Amen? Amen. Integrity. And integrity, reputation is what men think you are. And integrity and character is what God knows you are. Amen. For I can show you one side of me and be completely different somewhere else. Somebody better say amen. amen. And that can be a problem. Yeah. Having integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody's looking. Yeah. Realize that God sees you when other folks don't. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. God sees you, as Brother Dobson will say, 24-7. Yeah. 7 and 24 yeah. and 365. He sees you, amen, because my Bible teaches me that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is omniscient. He knows everything. And then Psalms 139 declares that he is omnipresent. So I can choose to act one way in God for this and act somewhere differently, a different way, and God sees me in South Carolina. God sees me in California. God sees me in Hawaii. God sees me in Bitcoin. Sin destroys our integrity. And I will be lying to you this morning if I didn't tell you that the church is not immune to the struggles with sin and integrity. Immorality, we've seen stories in the news, we've seen stories up close and personal. Immorality committed by those in the church can devastate a church family, can devastate a family. Immorality can happen from the pulpit to the door. If you look at 1 Thessalonians today, Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul tells us that you know how we entered in. You knew about us. You knew from the time we walked in here into Thessalonica, Thessalonians, what we were about. 
Amen. What we stood for. And even though we had been mistreated prior to. See, Paul was a missionary. He started churches and he went from town to town to town. And some towns welcomed him and some towns didn't. Even though they knew how he had been treated in Philippi, he still maintained his integrity and he maintained to live by the standard of God. And then he says, our preaching, look at the verse, verse 2 and verse 3 and verse 4. It was not out of deceit or out of uncleanness, nor guile. We weren't trying to trick because the gospel is infallible and it's inerrant, which that simply means God's word is true. Why should I try to trick you into believing something I already know is true? Amen? Amen? He even says we were trying to be sexually immoral. Amen. That's not a different day, a different sermon. We'll just deal with that here right now, right here today. It is important for the people of God to understand if you're going to minister to somebody, you can't have already ministered to them in another way. And be effective. I had an older preacher say it this way, don't expect to try to preach to them if you've done other things. Amen. 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 And our ministry, although he is saying here, the Apostle Paul is saying that some had been, had accused them of this, he said, God knows. And God has tried us. Amen. Now look at verse 4. It says, in fact, in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, power, the power verse here, the part of this verse is, is powerful. It says, we are entrusted with this gospel. Now, time out. Understand this. If we are going to be committed to the standard of God, then we've got to understand that he has called us and infused us, empowered us with this great gospel. And that, my friends, is a privilege. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, we have this treasure that is in earthen vessels. Now, somebody brought this out yesterday in the class that I was teaching. You know, God could have chosen to preach this thing himself. And he'd have done a far better job than I can do. Because, see, I fall short. I'm human. I'm not perfect. But why did he choose sinful man, earthen man, dirty, unclean man, men like Paul, men like Peter, men like myself, other men who have been at times the lowest of the low? Why does he choose earthen vessels? Because it takes earthen vessels to connect with earthen vessels. Understand this, that when somebody sees your life turn around, they have to say, like the old spiritual say, there must be a God somewhere. For I remember when, and God turned them around. See, Paul understood this. He was humble that God would entrust us with such a great task as preaching the gospel. And it's not just preachers, saints. You all, if you've been saved, are to carry the message of the gospel to the world. The Apostle Paul was serious about serving with integrity. He was serious. In fact, if you look at verse 4, it says, We were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak, we are not about pleasing men. But we're about pleasing God because it is God who sits high and looks low. And he trieth the hearts of men. Old folks used to say, playtime is out. The time for playing is far been spent. It, it, let me say it this way. The time for playing church is far few in between. We've got a mission. 
Amen. The church should already be serious about this task. If you don't believe it, look at the news. And it does not take a rocket scientist to look at all that's going on around us and right under our nose to see that Jesus' return is inching closer and closer and closer. Oh, there goes those preachers again. They've been saying that for years. Jesus is coming back. Yes, he is. And he will come when you least expect it. We got a task at hand, church. It is not time for pastors to be running around doing whatever they want to do. And whatever they think they're big and bold and bad enough. It's not time for preachers to come just with whatever and do however they want to do. It is not time for the deacons to be enamored with the things of the world. It is not time for those who are in the church to just live however they want. You cannot be on your knees like you need to be when you've been in the clubs chasing after the world. Well, amen. We either have to decide for God I will live and for God I will die or I'm just on the edges running around, yeah, yeah. not fully in. Yeah. In fact, I like what Minister Smith did for me a few months ago. He gave me a shirt, and I wrote this down, and the shirt said, ministry, ministry. On the front of it, I do believe that's what it said, ministry, we're not in it for the income, but we're in it for the outcome. Translation. It doesn't matter about the money. It matters about souls. If I can help somebody along the way, if I can help them in word or song, help them that they're traveling and understand that they may be wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Time, folks, to stop worrying about a payday on this side and understand that there is a payday on the other side. I have three things I want to leave with you this morning, and then I'll take my seat. Three things that are in this passage of scripture from verses 5 through 12. Get your highlighter, get your pen, whatever you choose to do, get a piece of paper, but I want you to write these three things down. If we are going to be committed to the standard of God. Here is what it's going to take. We've got to have boldness in the face of adversity. We've got to have boldness in the face of contention. In this, in this fallen, chaotic world, amen, we've got to lift up the standard of God. In fact, the old folks used to say this way. We've got to hold up the bloodstain banner. We've got to hold it up until we die. We're going to live in this fallen, chaotic world. We've got to declare the truth even when those around us say, I don't believe that. I don't want to hear that. I don't care about your Jesus. We've got to still be bold enough in the face of contention. Isn't it exciting, those of you who have gone out and witnessed when someone accepts the Lord and comes in? And you're excited. In fact, I've heard people say, I went out, we witnessed, and somebody got saved, and we want to go right back out there. But how many of you have ever done that and understand and realize the next time, the next door around the block, they may slam the door in your face? They may curse you out. They may even call the police. They may tell you they don't want to hear you. Everybody doesn't accept the message of the cross. In fact, look no further than Jesus as, as an example. If you remember in Mark, the third chapter, he went to church. And he saw a man with a withered hand. Amen. He healed that man. That man moved from wither and withered to whole. Amen. Y'all remember that sermon? And, and God used Jesus there in that church. And then he leaves out and he calls his disciples. Mark 3, 14 and 15. And he ordained the twelve that they should be with 
him. They should know him. And they should go for him. Then as he's calling them, there are so many people coming that they don't have enough to feed folks. They don't even have time to eat bread. This is in Mark, the third chapter. And people are coming and Jesus is preaching the gospel and his family gets wind of it. I said his family gets wind of it. And in, in, in verse 20 and 21 of Mark, the third chapter, they said, let's go get him. He's done lost his mind. His family rejected him. Amen? Amen? His family said he's beside himself. He is what? Crazy. Amen. Maybe you got some family members that have rejected you when you tried to talk to them about the Lord. You've got to be bold in the midst of contention. Amen. Bold and with tact. Amen, somebody. Amen. Paul, in this particular passage of scripture, he mentions, go back to verse 2, he mentions another town he had been in, what is the name of that town? Philippi. You all know what happened to Paul and Philippi, or Thessalonians and Acts goes together. Amen. Paul was beaten in Philippi. Well, why was he beaten, preacher? Well, Paul was minding his own business. He was churching the market. Amen. He went to the market and had church in the market. I'd like to do that one of these Maybe we can just all go to the mall and have church. <laughs> Somebody shook their head yes and I saw no. I want to look at some of the deals. I'm teasing. Amen. He churched the market. And while he was there, a young girl who was possessed but the Bible says with the spirit of divination, the spirit of python, had her wrapped up. And her master, she was a slave girl, used her for profit because she would attempt or use, they used her to tell people's futures, fortune teller. She followed Paul around and she spoke something true. She said, these men preach about the most high God. They are servants of the Most High God. And after a few days of this, her crying is out as Paul was trying to work. He turned around and he was able by the power of God to cast the devil out of him. But time out. When he did that, she could no longer serve her masters and make money for them. They threw Paul in exile, in jail, and there begins Acts 16, 25, my favorite, one of my favorite verses. And at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises unto God. They were bold in their contention for Christ. Now, time out, preachers. They had just been beaten for, for, for preaching the gospel and for casting the devil out of this girl. Don't you think you ought to get in prison, Paul, and be quiet? No, 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 no. Don't you imagine this. In the darkness of that cell, Paul opens up his mouth and begins to sing a hymn. I don't know what it was, but he might have said, a charge to keep I have. A God to glorify. Amen. He began to open up his mouth and maybe he might have said, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. He might have even just saying, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and our griefs to bear. Amen. He wasn't, he wasn't quiet. They began to sing and to praise God. So this is Paul when he mentions Philippi. What has happened in Philippi? He was beaten, so he moves on to the next town. Thessalonica. And if Paul had been like some of us, he might have stopped at the motel on the outskirts of Thessalonica and said, let's rearrange this mindset. Now, last town, we preached Jesus. Last town, we ministered. And we got beat up and thrown in jail. Uh, why don't we try this time, Silas? Uh, why don't we try to um, avoid D 
demon-possessed girls. In fact, Silas, if you see one coming, I'll go this way and, and you go that way. Uh, why don't we this time, Silas, instead of knocking on doors, why don't we just leave the track on the doorstep? That way nobody will be offended. Do I have a praying church in here with me this morning? Uh, Silas, why don't we this time, instead of, uh, of preaching how we did, why don't we just switch up our message a little bit? Why don't we preach that God wants to just bless you? And, and let's not worry about preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. No. They didn't stop at a motel on the outskirts of Thessalonica. They marched right in there. And he said, in the midst of contention, though you do bad things to me, though you beat me up, I can't help but remember there was a time when I was knocked off my beast and I saw a voice and I heard, I heard a voice and saw no man. That personage was Jesus Christ and I know he's changed my life around. And I can't do anything else but preach Jesus and him crucified. I can't do anything else but preach Jesus and him crucified. I'm not going to change my message. Jesus loves me. This I know. And I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it. The second thing we have to have, church, if we're going to be committed to the standard of God, is not only boldness in the midst of contention, but if we're going to have boldness in the midst of contention, we have to have a blameless character. Amen. Amen. We have to have a blameless character. Now, what does that mean, preacher? Don't people mess up? Don't we, don't we solicit blame? Yes, but we have to go boldly before the throne of grace and ask God to forgive us. And when he does, he helps us to move forward and move on and say, yes, I messed up, but I'm forgiven. And now I'm walking in the, in the newness of Christ Amen. every day. And I try my best to live a life that is blameless, a life that is Christ-like. Boldness must be joined with blamelessness. You won't trust a man's message if you don't trust a man. Amen. Integrity is expected of those who present the gospel. If hypocrites are evident in the pulpit, who's going to trust us? Amen. Somebody ought to say amen. Because we've all have witnessed or seen somebody, something like that. You have to understand, if you're going to preach the message, it's got to be a pure message. And the message is pure, so why not match up with what you are preaching? This hits me first, church. Amen. I must preach the gospel, but I must also live it. You must carry the gospel, and you must also live it. Look at verses 5 through 8. It says, we must have proper motives. In fact, it says there that he said, I treated you Thessalonians as I would treat my own children. Look at that. In fact, he says affectionately. Look at verse 7 and verse 8. As a nurse cherishes her children. As a mother will love and feed her child. Affectionately desirous of you. Which means I loved you. Therefore, I tried my best to be blameless in front of you and preach to you in the correct manner. Yes, sir. A church that's committed to the standard of God. But look at it. Look at verse 9. It says, he not only did that, he tried to live blameless, but he worked at building yes. relationships. Yes. Lord have mercy. Some folks are just in ministry. Not only for the income, but for the next step up. Somebody, I, I, I understand that this morning. They're always looking for the next big thing. The next big church. I'm going to take this and turn it from this into a mega church. Amen. Some folks are looking for the next big climb. Amen. They're looking for the 
the next big payoff or next big promotion. But how many of you understand that when you're looking for that, you miss the people that are right under your nose? The people that God has placed you here, you know, here to build relationships with. And that is the strength of the church, Pink Creek. The strength of the church is the power that Jesus Christ resides inside the believer that helps us to network and reach out and understand somebody here needs my testimony. Somebody here needs the time that I can spend with them. That's why we have said from day one, worshiping Jesus our Savior and our Lord, evangelizing the lost world, and mentoring generations to lead. Why I sit here year after year and never pass on what you know? Because as you pass by, you better be passing it on because you're not going to be here forever. Relationships. Instead of worrying about going up the ladder, worry about going next door. Some folks so busy climbing, they never walk. Some folks so busy and head up in the clouds that they never see those who are getting over. Those who need help. Those that would benefit from your story. For only you have been through what you've been through. And somebody can use what you have. Paul said, I know other churches are doing this and that, but I've decided that I want to build relationships here at Thessalonica. It's not about the money. I have other churches helping me financially, and then I want you to understand this morning, it's in the book, Paul worked himself. For he spent time with Priscilla and Aquila who were tent makers. He said, it's not about me. I just want to serve God. And even though I've been snake bitten and shipwrecked, and thrown in jail and beaten and left for dead, I still preach Christ and him crucified. Do you understand this morning? It is a pastor's desire to see his sheep, to see them walking in power and walking in integrity and a passion for Christ. Well, understand this. We have to be bold in the midst of contention. Have a blameless character. But the last thing, we got to have some biblical convictions. Biblical convictions. Somebody may say, well, does it make any difference what you believe? As long as you live right? Mm. Or, or, or does it make any difference? Let's, let's switch it around. Does it make any difference how you live? As long as you believe in your heart what's right. Lord have mercy. Do you understand God judges your heart? And my Bible says, so if a man's heart, if whatever is in a man's heart, it will come out. As a man's heart, so as a man's heart is, so he is. Amen. And the Bible also says in Proverbs 4 and 23, it says that you need to guard your heart. For out of your heart flow the issues. Of life. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, your heart determines your behavior. Amen. Many of you in here believe that the Buckeyes are the best and the greatest college team ever. Y'all missed your chance. Some of y'all sitting there dazed and confused. I just said, a lot of us, a lot of you in here, believe that the Buckeyes are the greatest college football team ever. Amen. And so therefore then, Brother Anderson, amen. Brother Pops, Brother Bowles, I can keep naming. Therefore then, your behavior matches your belief. Or on every Saturday, a lot of you butt nuts, plum, lose your mind. So the man is in his heart. As he thinks it and believes it, so he acts. 
Amen. Stay with me. So having bold actions and blameless character mean nothing if you don't believe. If you're not having biblical convictions and your boldness and your blamelessness is a product of what you believe down on the inside. For the world will change. Things will disintegrate even further. Trust me, the Bible says so, not me. And a time is going to come when men are already either lovers of themselves they're doing whatever they want to do. They're now calling right wrong and wrong right. And it's time for a church that is committed to the standard of God to not only be bold, bold and blameless, but to have some biblical convictions. As I read God's word, it handles me. It speaks to me. It motivates me. God's word cleans me up when I'm dirty. Amen. God's word, the Bible says, scripture is given, is profitable, is it rebukes, it corrects, it saves me. So I read God's word one day, I heard a song that says, I was shook when I looked in the book. How many of you had your world shaken up when you found out? I'm not as bad as I thought I was. I'm not the tough that I thought I was. I told the church on Wednesday, I remember a time like that in my life and the Lord literally brought me to my knees and all I could say was, Lord, why don't you help me? But deep down inside, what I had learned, what I had been taught, that word of God began to to flow and to erupt from my heart. And I heard the word of God said, I, even though I'm in trouble, even though I'm having struggle, I will lift up my eyes to the hills for whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. That same Lord that made the heavens and the earth. Well, somebody may ask you when you walk out of here today, what do you believe? at Paint Creek. What's going on up there at that church? I hear this and I hear that. What do you believe? What, what, what are you biblically convicted about? What are some of your convictions? What kind of standard are you raising up up there at that church? I'll tell you in case you don't know. Amen. I like the song that says we believe in God the Father. And we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given me new life. I believe in the crucifixion. And I believe that he conquered over death. And I believe that he's resurrected. And how many of you believe this morning that he is coming back again. What do you believe up there at that church? What are you committed to up there at that church? What is your biblical conviction? I believe that in the eons of time, long time ago, a council sat in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They said, now we will create man and he will fall. And when he falls, it's not a question of what we can do, but it's a question of what we will do. Jesus, you go down in a body of flesh. And you will be born from a virgin by the name of Mary in a town called Bethlehem. And when you are born, you'll grow up. And you'll live a perfect life. Yeah. Amen. And, and after you get been about 30 years old, you're going to begin your public ministry. Yeah. Amen. And I'm glad that they decided, they, they worked it out and they said, when you begin your public ministry, you're going to meet some contention. Yeah. You're going to have to have a blameless character. 
and you will. And you have to be bold in the face of contention. You have to have convictions about what you believe. How do you know you have convictions? Because one Friday in the Garden of Gethsemane, one Thursday night, he said, nevertheless, my will. But thou will be done. Jesus, you're going to have to go up on a hill called Calvary. Bold, blameless, the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. Do you understand that we believe here that Jesus died? Amen. Do you believe he died? The Bible says he died dead. And they took him down. Took him down off of that cross, that blood-stained cross, that blood-stained cross, the cross that hung where he hung between the heavens and the earth. They took him down, placed him in that borrowed tomb, rolled the stone in front of it, and there the soldiers stood and said, he's not going anywhere. He ain't going anywhere. We got soldiers. We've sealed the grave. And the devil is rejoicing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are satisfied. But they're not as satisfied as my God. For God said, I know that my son has died and he has covered a multitude of sin. And even though it pained him, he understood that Jesus died for the sins of the world. And so the grave is sealed, and there lays Jesus. Friday evening. Oh my goodness. Saturday morning. Amen. Saturday afternoon, and they're satisfied in themselves. Yes, they are. Saturday night, and they're going to bed feeling good about what they've done. But oh, right early, the earth shook, and a black light came, and that stone was rolled away, and I hear the Bible say, he is risen. Come see the place where he lay. He's not there. You, what do you do with the dead man? You bury him. But this dead man did he was supposed to. Why? Because he's Jesus the Christ. The son of the living God. What do you believe, Pinkree? What do you believe? What's down inside of him? I believe in Jesus. I believe he died. I believe he rose. And I believe he sits right now from the right hand of the Father. And when I'm not so blameless, he declares intercession and says, I forgave him. I forgave him. He's forgiven seed of blood. He's covered, 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 covered by my blood. And nothing that you can do can break him apart. I love him. Oh, I love him today, church. I love him today, church, because he first loved me. I have no other message to preach. I can preach this. And that, but I want to let you know as long as he allows me to stand here, I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to preach Jesus and him crucified. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm glad about it. Do I have somebody in here that understands that what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Jesus, what can cleanse me of a multitude of sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that blood. Amen.
to the standard of God. My Bible tells me that there's also another standard and it simply says in Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What are you talking about, preacher? There's one standard we can never reach. We can never be perfect, church. Amen. In and of ourselves. But I try to live right. I try my best to do what's right. And every now and then I do this and I do that, but God knows my heart. I've heard it all. I've said it all. Do you understand that you can never be good enough to ever get to heaven? Amen. Amen. As the music is played, do you understand that you can never do enough great things to get to heaven? But Jesus set the bar. And I hear him say that if anybody, whosoever, anybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Is there a time in your life when you can place your finger on it and you say, you know what? I realized that one day and I was a part of this sin sick world and I could not reach that standard and all that I could do, all that I could do was call on Jesus for salvation. Can you say that today? Is there a time in your life when you have called on Jesus to save you? If there is, then you ought to say amen. amen. But maybe, just maybe, there's somebody in here that says, I can't recall that time. Then if I were you, I'd make that time today. Amen. For the Bible says, in the day that you hear the Lord's voice speak to you and he speaks through his word, don't you dare harden your heart. For tomorrow is not promised. Amen. Amen. Is there one that wants to surrender to the Lord this morning? I guarantee you, you won't be disappointed. This joy that I have, amen. Why does that preacher scream and holler and talk? Why? This joy that I have inside, the world didn't give it to me. Amen. 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 And the world can't take it away. Amen. I enjoy Jesus every day. Amen. amen. I love the Lord every day. And he loves me. And he'll do the same for you. Is there one this morning that wants to say, I want to trust him as Savior? Why don't you come? Is there one that wants to come for prayer? Maybe somebody here that you're looking for a church home and you want to come and join your, yourself to this church. Why don't you come? Somebody that needs prayer. The prayers of the righteous avail much. Come and let us pray for you. Amen. Only trust him. Is there one? Is there one? Is there one? Just that he will save you. Do you believe it?
thank you for the opportunity to pray. You know what we have need of even before we ask. I don't know these situations, but God, you know the prayers of the righteous avail much. And Lord, we just ask you to touch each and every one. Answer the prayer according to your will. That you may be glorified, that you may be honored and praised in answering our prayer. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the healing. We thank you, we thank you for salvation. Whatever the need may be, you know what it is. Lord, we lift it up to you. We believe in the power of prayer. You said, if any two agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done unto them my Father, which is in heaven. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Little bit, okay, we 